Uh, we are so excited to have you join us this evening to learn more about what the Kentucky Academic Standards for Social Studies look like in practice. In this interactive webinar, Heather and I will start by breaking down the standard from the CAS for Social Studies. Next, in the second half of the webinar, we will be joined by Megan Sauter from the Kentucky Historical Society, and she will lead us through a social studies learning experience using sources and materials from the Kentucky Historical Society collection and other institutions across the country. So we're so excited that you are here with us this evening to engage in grade one uh, social studies through the lens of Kentucky history. So we will start this evening by looking at our webinar goals. So our learning goal is to support your implementation of the Kentucky Academic Standards for Social Studies through experiencing a grade level example. Today we're going to be looking at grade one. If you're joining us with other webinars, um, we look at other grade levels within the elementary grades uh, this season. So our success criteria are I can analyze 1.h kh1 to understand what the standards require students to know and be able to do. Next, I can improve my content knowledge and pedagogical skills after exploring a grade level sample. So first, before we do any work uh, with a grade level example, we really have to talk about what standards are. So standards define what students should know, understand, and be able to do at the end of the grade level. So no refers to facts, dates, places, people, definitions, rules, or information. Understand refers to those theories or generalizations or big ideas, those concepts and practices within the social studies that our disciplines are organized into, and then also do. That is all about the skills, such as communication, reading, computation, application, transfer, citation, all those things that are essential skills when you truly have students engaging in the social studies. So what does it mean to unpack a standard? So unpacking a standard really requires that you break down a standard into smaller, more explicit chunks for the purposes of curriculum development and or unit and or lesson planning. So if you see our example here, we're asking you to analyze the verb and the following standard to determine its meaning in terms of instruction and assessment. So for our purposes this evening, we're looking at grade one standard. This is a grade one civic standard in process and rules. And it asks students to investigate rules and laws in Kentucky to understand their purpose. So if you're trying to understand what the standard is asking students to know and be able to do, just really look at that verb, right? So what does investigate actually mean in the standard? Does it mean make meaning of? Does it mean to transfer? Does it mean to accurately state and explain? Or does it simply mean to know? What does a verb demand in terms of student learning? So investigate is a verb that you will see consistently throughout the Kentucky Academic Standards for Social Studies. As a student progresses in their demonstration of investigation, as they investigate more things in more communities, in more historical periods and through the different disciplines, a student's understanding what investigate means will get more and more sophisticated, right? But for today, we're looking at this with a grade one standard. So what does it mean to investigate rules and laws in Kentucky? In grade one, it really refers to knowing, to understanding what their purpose is. So a way to figure out what investigation means, um, you can actually look at some of the clarification statements provided in the CAS. So the clarification statement for this particular standard talks about how rules and laws are created to establish order, benefit citizens, and keep people safe. And it talks about maybe, you know, what are some laws in Kentucky that kids have to uh, pay attention to and follow to protect their safety, going to school, wearing seat belts. So investigate here isn't asking that a student knows the number of the law that says that they have to wear seat belts, but it's really about investigating why they have to wear seat belts. They have to wear seat belts to ensure that they are safe, and that is a law in Kentucky. So when you're breaking down a standard, it's really important to do this work with your colleagues. So it allows us collegial conversations that should result in a common agreement on the learning expectations. So it's all about defining the language of the standard, figuring out what is, you know, how does a clarification statement provide more clarity to what the standard is asking the student to do in a grade level appropriate way. 
It's asking you to determine the level of rigor indicated, right? Like what I just said about investigation. As students, when students investigate in high school, it should look very, very different than what students are doing in um, grade one. It requires you analyze and translate the standard to better incorporate into curriculum, unit, and lesson plans. And analysis is essential at the local level if the standards are to be validly and consistently taught among teachers. So what we're going to do now, I'm going to turn it over to Heather, and she's actually going to help us break down the standard that we will be working with tonight. OK, so this is our tool to unpack standards, and this can be found on kystandards.org, among all of our other resources. And so you can see here we're going to do the first four steps today. Uh, so step one is going to be starting with the standard. So for step one, you're just going to simply list your standards. So cut and paste that standard. Um, whether it's a disciplinary standard, inquiry standard, whatever you're looking at in that far left column. And then so step two is what knowledge, concepts, vocabulary that students will need to master. So here you're going to look closely at that standard and you're going to identify what are the things that students need to learn about? What, what do they need to know? And so some of the things here that you can pull from that standard, events of the past, people of the past, innovation of the past, impacts on their lives, community, and Kentucky. So next, to, oh, sorry. So to get a little bit more information and be able to add a little bit more to that, we can look at that disciplinary clarification, which you can see here. So the past impacts the present through the cultures which exist in an area, the ways people interact, and the technology which modern people use. And so taking that information, we can add a little bit more and so you can see there we've added impacts through culture, impacts through technology, impacts through inter interactions. And so, of course, the disciplinary clarifications are not the end all be all. That's just a starting point and just suggestions about some ways to get more into the standard and some more things that students should know. Step three is what skills will they need to master? So here you're going to look at your standard and you're going to identify the skills that are found within that standard. And so here you can see the verb is describe. And so describe is the skill that students will need in order to successfully demonstrate their knowledge of the standard. And finally, step four, what level of proficiency do students need to be at in order to, re to reach the standard? So describe is gonna be in that depth of knowledge as a level two. And so now what we are going to do is we are going to hand this over to Megan, who is going to walk you through a grade one learning experience that is all about grade one Kentucky history. And so in the material set you are looking at today, you'll see some from the Kentucky Historical Society and you'll see some from other institutions. But we really want you to pay attention to how Megan models working with these resources, the questions that she asks you. Um, she will also remember, um, as we talked about before this webinar started, we talked about how um, we want this to be very interactive. So Megan will give you directions on how to participate in this in certain activities, whether she wants you to drop those in the chat or to unmute. Um, so please, uh, joining me in welcoming Megan into uh, this session where we really learn and take a deeper dive into Kentucky history. So Megan, it is all yours. All right. Can everybody see my screen and hear me OK? Are we good? Lauren, yes. I can't see you. OK. Yes. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for that introduction. I work for the Kentucky Historical Society, and we are currently in our busy field trip season. And so on the slide right now, you can see our three sites, the Thomas D. Clark Center for Kentucky History, and we have a permanent exhibit that has 12,000 years worth of Kentucky history, our Kentucky Military History Museum that goes over stories of conflict and compromise, and our old state Capitol building. So we give tours about three branches of government, and students can demonstrate to the legislative branch there. And so what I'm going to be walking you through today is looking at a Kentuckian. And so the people of Kentucky are so prominent in how our history plays out. And I chose inventor Garrett Morgan. And so an overview of what the activity will be, students will analyze a good invented by a Kentuckian in the early 20th century to determine the community impact. Our compelling question, how can an individual impact their community? And so the example that we'll be looking at will inspire students to think through that. 
And our supporting question, how does Garrett Morgan's breathing device impact your community? And again, the standard connection that Heather went over, describe how events, people, and innovation of the past affect their present lives, community, and state. And then a couple vocabulary terms to break down with your students. A patent. A patent is a government license to give the inventor the sole right to produce and sell their creation. So it's basically a permission slip to make things. A good is a tangible item that can be seen, touched, and owned by consumer or customer. So that's pretty much anything you can buy, but you can also trade goods. And we'll be using those terms throughout it. And I want to introduce Garrett Morgan. Garrett Morgan, an African-American, was born in Claysville, Kentucky on March 4th, 1877. So nearly 150 years ago. At the age of 14, he started working as a handyman and later opened his own repair shop. This experience taught Morgan how things worked and were made, which inspired him to become an inventor. And so here I would kind of open it up with the students like, who wants to be an inventor? Who likes to make things? So Morgan liked to work with his hands. He liked to tinker. So an inventor was a perfect career for him. In creating a breathing device, which we will dive into what that is, Morgan also repaired and sold sewing machines. He used his skills to sew a hood to go over your head that could be worn as a breathing device that would prevent the inhalation of smoke. Morgan sold this device to firefighters, so he had to have his own lab or shop, which means he also ran his own business and was an entrepreneur. And to sell your own invention, what do you have to have to protect your design? So that's our first vocab term, a U.S. patent. So to prevent others from stealing the design, he had to register the patent with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And so they keep that on file in case anybody needs to go back and look at it. And that is also where I found this one that we are going to be studying. And this is the original drawing from 1912, so a primary source. And to analyze this, we are going to be using um, a technique that we use in the museum quite a bit. It's called visual thinking strategies. And so it's just an inquiry based teaching method. And I focus on three questions and we use this to help uh, analyze 2D artifacts as well as 3D artifacts. And so you all can unmute as we look at this patent. And I'm going to ask you to take a moment to study the image and then I will have three questions for you. OK, so take a moment to study this. And in the classroom, I give the students like a full minute to really look through it. And I'll bring them to the carpet so they can see it closer. So what's going on in this picture? Um, he's designing a breathing device. OK, and what makes you say that? Um, it's the second line at the top um, of the patent, and then I remember it on one of the background slides. You had mentioned something about firefighting, so at first I thought scuba, <laughs> and yeah. then um, I kind of brought it back to some of the context that you provided. Okay, what more can we find? It looks like there's two things that stand out in terms of dates. One, when it was filed, and then two, when it was patented. OK, so noticing the dates on the image. What more can we find? There's a witness that's documented. OK, and why would the witness be important and what more can you say about that? So oh, I'm seeing where the inventor has signed it, and since this is for a patent, I can see where at this time that witness would have been super important to be another source of evidence that the inventor had actually created such device. Thank you. What more can you find? I hear some kiddos in the background. Maybe they want to <laughs> participate. <laughs> Anything 
else? I, I think I'm the only other thing. What... Go ahead. Go ahead, Thomas. <laughs> I, I think the only other thing that you know I would note is just like it's the 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 general design of kind of what it looks like, uh, kind of in the round from the front, the back, and the side. Mm -hmm. So looking at all sides of it for the design. And I was just wondering about the number in the top left. Maybe it's because I'm a numbers girl, but I didn't know what that number was. It didn't have anything sort of telling us it in the same way that the other elements of the di of the patent did. OK, so posing a question, wondering what that number is at the top left. All right, well, thank you all. And so that is just a short VTS discussion. And so notice how I said, I kept saying, what more can you find? What more can you find? And then I would follow up, what, what do you see that makes you say that? So that the students start to provide evidence for their thinking. And then I wouldn't give you the answer until the very end, and then we can discuss that. Um, but then once you bring it together, you can also talk about how smoke rises and looking at that, what looks like an elephant trunk. I normally get that <laughs> at the bottom is the filter. And so with smoke rising, then they're getting clean air at the bottom to breathe. And this is a prototype. And so a prototype is just an example of the good. And so notice how it looks much different than the drawing. And so when they're designing this, they may have encountered problems and found different solutions to fix them. So you notice the filter is much larger. It's more like a sack. And over time, these designs can be improved based on different materials, how someone is using it, technology. And this prototype is another primary source. And it is currently on display at the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC. And so we looked at a drawing, 2D artifact. We looked at an object. Now we're gonna look at some text as another primary source. And this is an advertising pamphlet. And I want you to think about the question, why would someone wear a fire hood? So that we can start to get to the purpose. In the teacher notes, there is a modified text for this. Um, and I will read that shortly, but I wanna show you where you can find it. So the Western Reserve Historical Society and you can zoom into it. And when you analyze this with students, you can point out the date. So looking at 1913, so about a year after that patent, you can analyze this image too. So you can see it looks like the prototype and how they're wearing it. It's going to the back and maybe they're saving someone right here. And it talks about the fire chief and the fire department. So those are the people that are using it. And then notice the price. So it's costing $100. And so the purposes of the fire hoods are to allow the person wearing it to enter a room that is filled with dangerous smokes and gases. This will help them save lives, stop whatever is causing the smoke and gases and put out fires. So if you want to unmute, why would someone wear a fire hood? Um, to be safe, especially if there's like a lot of smoke. Yes, to be safe. Thank you, Kim. Anyone else? So to be safe, that also means that you're healthy. And so if the firefighters are healthy, they're going to be able to save other people and also to put out the fire so it can help preserve people's goods too. All right, so then and now we're going to discuss change over time. So think about the firefighters you have seen today. Do you think the design has changed for firefighters today, thinking about that fire hood? So yes. Do you think the material has changed? And you can unpack those answers too. You can say, what makes you say that? Do you think they are cheaper or more expensive today? Megan, you're getting lots of head nods. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> I think awesome. I think well, one I think oh, one thing ahead. the kids the kids will talk about too is that nowadays they're going to actually see someone wear these things and they're going to have a familiarity with it, especially like with the modern design and stuff. So I mean, yeah, having worked with first graders, they know all about that stuff. 
Yeah, it's very relatable. You see firefighters out in the community at different events. Maybe they come to the school. All right, so this is a current day firefighter air pack. And now have you noticed the price? So it's over 100 times or well, about 100 times expensive. So goods are much more expensive today than in the past. The material has changed from fabric to these hard plastics, metal. Notice the tinted eyeglass. And so that's probably a very durable plastic. And so that's due to science and technology. And so change over time. So more expensive materials, more durable. But the purpose has stayed the same. So the community impact is the same. It's still saving lives. It's protecting the firefighter, helping their health. It's stopping fire to helping them stop the fire to prevent more damage. So the impact is the same. Now we're going to act like a historian and I have these questions up. So these are the same questions that I asked you during the patent. That's that visual thinking strategies inquiry based teaching method. And so you'll actually see this device in use. And so you're going to take a moment to study the image and I'm going to ask you what's going on in this image. What do you see that makes you say that and what more can you find? Are you ready to act like a historian? OK, and you can unmute. Same thing, so take a moment to study this image. All right, what is going on in this picture? Someone is being rescued. OK, what makes you say that? Judging by how the man looks injured or he doesn't look well and he's having to be held or like propped up by other people or carried by them. OK, so we think that somebody that he's rescuing him because the way that the man is is laid and being propped up by somebody else. What more can we find? It, it looks like the man who is kind of holding him up without the hat had been wearing the kind of breathing device. As you can see, the kind of what it looks like it's kind of unstrapped on the back of his uh, on the on his back. You can see kind of the, the hood. OK, so the man that is holding up the other man, it looks like he has the breathing device strapped on his back and was using it. What more can we find? It looks like the person holding him with a hat might be like maybe a police officer or something, which kind of lends to Kim's statement of it looks like somebody's being rescued. OK, and what makes you say he's a police officer? He just looks kind of fancy, <laughs> like his hat looks like it's got the badge on the front of it, like and he's like in the dark uniform. Um, he just stands out. He's wearing a hat, but his hat is different from everyone else's. Um, and and seems to have that emblem on the front, which made me think that maybe that's a symbol um, of some sort. OK, so noticing that this could be a police officer because of the emblem or the badge on his hat and his hat is different from the other ones. So the police officer could be helping. What more can we find? Well, I don't think the emergency is over. I think whatever's happening is still going on. And what makes you say that? Because even though this guy looks really injured or doesn't look healthy, there's a lot of people in the picture that are still looking towards something else. They're not looking at the guy that's injured. OK, so maybe the emergency or whatever has happened is still going on because we notice the faces of the other people behind them looking at something else. What more can we find? This may have happened um, like in a downtown setting because it looks as if several different community members from a town based on the hats they're wearing, representing different businesses perhaps, and socioeconomic groups. So it, perhaps it's something that's happening in a town. OK, so we think that whatever has happened has happened in maybe a downtown or a town because of the different people that we're seeing. What more can we find? 
And Megan, we just had a comment in the chat of something we're not seeing. So um, a comment from Maggie in the chat says there aren't any women in the picture, at least that she isn't able to see. Okay, so noticing what we cannot or what we're not seeing in this image that there are no women represented. What more can we find? The, the year is certainly not current year based on the attire they're wearing, the hats, style of hats they're wearing. Okay, so not the current, not a modern time because of the style of hats that they are wearing. So if you play on that idea of that, thinking about the time period, what more can we find? one thing the kids would notice is that the picture's in black and white that yep, it's not in color see. that they would they would go to that yep so noticing that the picture is in black and white so that's kind of dating it for us all right you all did a fantastic job thank you so much um, notice the questioning technique that i was using and i was i also introduced paraphrasing so as pair of it phrasing the responses um, in the classroom. What you can do too is link kids responses. So, oh, you agree with this one or this relates to what Johnny said. Um, so you can also link that way. And we are always respectful. We respectfully agree or disagree while we're having this discussion. Um, and now I'll tell you what it is. So the Waterworks Tunnel disaster happened in Cleveland, Ohio in 1916. So Waterworks is a place that provides drinking water. Garrett Morgan Hurt about this disaster, grabbed his fire hood, his safety hood, and entered the gas-filled tunnel underneath the Lake Erie to rescue workers that were in an explosion. And so he definitely impacted his community by saving lives. Now we're ready for the quick write. And so when you do this with the students, it doesn't have to be a polished assignment. It's just a way for you to gauge their understanding. And the way that we're going to do it today is that you're going to put into the chat and then somebody will have to, to read a couple of them. Um, so how does Garrett Morgan's invention of the firefighter breathing device impact your community? In your response, use evidence from two or more sources. And Megan, I'll volunteer to read those. Okay, thank you. People are still typing. You can see okay. the little three dots in the chat, but I'll let you know <laughs> as soon as we get one. And also, too, if for any reason you are unable to type in the chat, because I know sometimes technology can be a little 
little interesting in the evening. You are also um, able to unmute and share as well. We have our first responses coming in. So one that it impacts my community by allowing fighter fighters to save lives in source one. We saw how the invention fit the person's face so they'd be able to breathe safely to go in and pull someone out of a fire. In the second source, we saw the crowd around a man who had been pulled from the fire. So thank you, Missy, for that. Um, Kim shares knowing that firefighters have access to these devices now, as I saw in the advertising husband the second source tells me that we are safer in our community because our firefighters will be able to rescue us just like the man did in the black and white picture. Thomas shares the firefighting breathing device impacts my community because this technology is still used today to help firefighters in my community as seen in the description of the modern device. Perfect. Those are great. Go ahead. I said we still have a few more coming in, but I can see just the three dots that people are typing. So um, I can share those whenever they're ready or it's whatever you would like to do right now. Maybe okay. Or, wait or yeah, and you all can you all can read those in the chat too, but that's great. So I hope you can see how your students can respond to this as well, um, especially with it being a firefighter and being able to relate to that. But I am going to go on to show you an extension activity. So what more you can do with this lesson or investigation. Um, so you can act like an inventor. And so I would start this with a Turner talk to get the creative juices flowing. But you can think about your home, your school, the community. And these are the questions that have your students kind of brainstorm. What could be improved or created to help people or animals they like to help their pets at home to complete a task. What would be what would the good be made of? It's thinking about the materials and how much would it cost? Um, one thing to do with this, too, is to bring the class back together and make sure that you're brainstorming and discussing those ideas so that you can help walk through what they want to create before you give them materials, because we are going to start kind of like an arts activity here. Um, they're going to have to draw it, so they have to have a patent or a design. And so you can see my example, it has a metal lid. So talking about the materials, a glass bottle, it is a thirst detector. So that is my innovative design. So it's an improvement of a current water bottle, but it's going to be able to detect if you're dehydrated or not. So it's going to turn red and warn you that you need to drink something and then it will turn green. And so you could have any kind of examples that you want to come up with. Um, when I've done this in the classroom, sometimes I'll have students finish early and I'm walking around. So then I'll say, OK, go ahead and turn it around, turn the paper around and then create an advertisement because you're going to have to sell this device. And um, so this is an example of the advertisement. That's when they can start to think about the price, what it's going to be called. So the thirst detector by drink H2O. So that's the company. Maybe they want to create a logo. And then to take it a bit further, they can build the prototype. And so I've had students bring in recyclables before. So it can be paper towel rolls, um, cereal boxes, plastic cups, or straws. And so these are created with paper straws. They're very easy to bend and tape. Um, with the tape, it's masking tape. I normally go around and just put some small pieces of masking tape on their desk so that they can grab it easy. And then they don't have to worry about trying to tear it. Um, you can use construction paper to add to it, or they can even color it if they have markers that they can pull out and color them. Um, and just remind them that it's a prototype because some of them will be like, well, it's not going to work. Well, it's just a design. Then you'll send it off to the factory and then they'll build it. So it's just an example of the design. And then to wrap it up, you can have them present. So that's another way you can me measure comprehension. It's a fun activity to get them to pitch their idea, and they do have quite a bit of fun with it. And then um, taking that skeleton of the unit, you can also introduce other patents and designs. So Morgan continued to impact the community by inventing other goods. This is an example of his traffic signal patent. So somebody would be standing there and cranking it. So one of the first stoplights. Um, there's also another advertising sheet from the Western Reserve Historical Society that you can zoom in to learn more or do the VTS with it again. And that is the whole investigation that I have for you. I wanted to thank all the organizations that provided the sources, the primary sources, and we are using these for educational purposes. I hope that you will use this in your classroom and the teacher notes that are provided. I also have different links so that you can learn more about Garrett Morgan.